morning, church. Good morning, class. We're going to learn a new song together today. I know it's new. I know you've never heard this song before because, because I wrote it. So I know you haven't heard this one. Let's stand together. It's going to be easy. It's kind of like a, uh, if you've ever been to summer camp, it's like a song you sing at cummer, summer camp. I'll sing a line, you sing a line, I'll sing a line, you sing a line. We'll sing a line together, and then we'll do the chorus together. It's very easy. Now, I say I wrote it. I actually co-wrote it with this kid named David. David was really good with words, but he couldn't play guitar. He was good with harp, though. You'll see where I'm going here. It's Psalm 25 is what it is. We put it to music, and we're going to sing it together. Now, it's gonna, we're going to go once through. I'll sing, and you sing with them, okay? Let's try it. This is just, just to, to get an idea of how it's going to go. And we'll put the words up for you this time, too, Jeff. How about that? To you, O Lord, to you, o Lord I, lift my soul, I lift my soul. In you, O Lord, in you, o Lord alone, I trust. alone I trust. Teach me your past. Teach me your Show past. me your ways. Show me your ways. Guide me in your truth, O Lord, and teach me. See how easy that is? Now, when we get to the chorus, it goes like this. For you are my God. You are my Savior. Yes, you are my God. You are my Savior. My hope is in you. My eyes are ever on you. Redeem me, oh God. I take refuge in you. That's all there is to it. Now, you guys do pretty good with this because we're grading on a scale. And first first service, they did pretty good. So I'm counting on you guys to show them up. Are you ready? Let's see if we can do it. To you, O oh Lord, to you, oh Lord I, lift my soul. I lift my soul. In you, O oh Lord, you, oh Lord alone, I trust. alone I trust. Teach me. give you a little bit higher grade in the first service. Let's have a word of prayer before we continue our worship this morning. We need to do a little transition here. We've promoted our drummer to percussionist. I have a lot of faith that he'll be able to keep up with me. Let's pray with him.
Father, thank you so much for the beautiful day that you've given us to come into your house to worship. And Father, we know that we, this is not something that we take lightly because so many places around this world, it's, there are people meeting to worship you in basements, in small homes, in, in any place they can get together to worship you. And we have a unique freedom of being able to come into this house together to worship you. So Father, we give you all the praise and the word that you are worthy of this morning. We honor you in everything we do. As we continue our worship, let us feel your presence. We know you are here. Let us experience you firsthand. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, I come. Sin runs deep, your grace is known, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent in you. Here I am to worship.
So, it looks like we've been getting some rain finally after being in a drought. The only problem is, we get rains and storms. You know, pop-up storms, big storms, we're just going to get a general rain. And we've been getting some destructive storms with the wind and hell and all that. That kind of reminds me, Jesus and his disciples, his ministry would talk and people would crowds be coming all the time and it just wearing out and they're on the lake and they got in a boat and was going across the lake to get away from the crowd and Jesus just was asleep just exhausted and the disciples were going out there and all of a sudden this storm comes up and the waves get big and it gets real dangerous and disciples are afraid for their life and here's Jesus sleeping and so they wake him up afraid for the lies and you know and Jesus stands and just calms the story. He just talks to it. The wind, the waves, just calm down. And the disciples are amazed that, you know, who is this that can do something like that, just control the weather? And his question to them was, where's your faith? And you got to realize life is full of storms, and many times they are surprises. They are like our pop-up storms we've been having, and we don't know when they're coming. They can happen in, at any moment. And they can be destructive and harmful and, and cause disruptions in life. You know, we've actually had storms that's caused house damages. We've had tornadoes, straight winds, hail, and caused damage, you know, that people are having to deal with. But storms can be, you get a phone call or email, you no longer have a job. car accident just happens like that. You could be playing golf with Jeff <laughs> and you get your ankle broken because he turns the golf cart over. Or you could be here at church and go home and later that day you're in the ER in the hospital with a blood clot. You never know what's going to happen in life. And the thing is we've got to realize in the story Jesus didn't keep the storm from happening. He dealt with the storm after they came to him to help. And we've got to realize the Bible doesn't promise. Jesus doesn't promise that he's going to put you in this big bubble or big ball. Have you seen those on TV or on shows that where these bubbles, you bump into each other, you really can't do anything? And you can't do anything if you're in a bubble. He doesn't promise that. But what it does promise is you accept him. He gives you your Holy Spirit. He's there for you each and every day providing for you and helping you through those storms. Not preventing them, but helping you through them in one way or another because you don't realize what can come out of those storms that we go through, how you can develop, how you can end up helping other people. And the thing we've got to understand is, as people, we tend to get focused on what's happening immediately. When the storm hits, that's what we're focused on. That's why it's so important we meet together as Christians to worship with the God, at, to re be reminded our God's in control. No matter what's happening, God's still ultimately in control. We know how everything ends. 
we've already been told the ending because of what Jesus did for us. And so coming together to worship is a reminder he's in control and we belong to him because we were in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's always there for us. We may not think so sometimes because what, you know, the things are going on, but he's in control. And just that's what we get to realize today as we come together. So let's be praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, a love that you created us in your image in spite of knowing that what would happen when you gave us free will. And when you did and we sinned and walked away from you and, and tried to hide from you, you sent your son into this world to die for our sins. You created this world and for us to have, and we didn't take care of it like we should. And you still provide for us each and every day out of that love. So as we worship this morning, just open up our hearts, our eyes, our minds to see you, to feel you, to realize who you really are and what you've really done for us, especially through your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks for sharing that with us, Lauren. I greatly appreciate that. And before I dive into it here this morning, I want to welcome those that are watching online. Thanks for being here. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, I want to encourage you uh, to stop by the Next Step station on the way out if you haven't already. And uh, um, and check out there if you want to see what's going on more with us. We have QR codes that are placed around the church. If you got that smartphone and you like to use it that way, that can let you see and connect you with things that are happening in this church and let you a little know a little bit more about uh, what's going on. But uh, one of the things I'm just going to ask is tomorrow morning, there's a bunch of youth and sponsors are going to be taken off uh, to spend the week at what's called CIY, Christ in Youth. And it's just going to be a whole week that they're away from, from their families. They're going to be away from TV. They're going to be just away from everything, an opportunity for them to have a chance to, to hear people talk about God and who he is and, and just to kind of speak and pour into their lives. So I'm going to ask that you just pray for them while they're gone, that that's exactly what can happen, that God can pour into their lives, speak a truth into their lives, you know, encourage them, challenge them, and stretch them in their lives, maybe in ways that they never, ever thought about uh, before. So I encourage you to do that. And uh, uh, several of you asked about, uh, and if you're watching online, several of you asked about our, our newsletters and, and wanting to know our newsletters that we send out, quarterly newsletters. Uh, if you haven't gotten that, stop at the Next Step station right out there and and, uh, they would love to get your information so we can make sure and get uh, that into your hands. So you can also see if you'd rather have the paper copy and not go online, do it that way, uh, of what's going on and, and uh, what is happening in the next next three months or so. But I want to start off, I want to I take a survey here, okay? Uh, uh, not a scientific survey, just a quick survey and ask you this question, okay? And just raise your hand if this applies to you. How many of you have struggles in life? Okay, that's good. That's good. You guys are a lot more honest than first service. All right, <laughs> they, they struggle with honesty, the first service does with it, but uh, well, we have these struggles, don't we? And as I was preparing and going through this, I, I, I read a couple cute little stories about the rookie baseball pitcher who was struggling, trying to, trying to get his pitch to come across the plate. And in this one game, the catcher came up to him and he says, you know, I figured out your problem. And this pitcher, he looks at him and he says, great, what is it? And, and, and he said, you always seem to lose control. You always seem to struggle at the same point, at the same point in every game. And he's like, great, tell me when is it? And he said, right after the national anthem. <laughs> you got to love to have that kind of support when you're struggling, right? You know, or maybe you're, you're more like the, the student, Ken, that was, he was a struggling student who during one of the exams was asked by his teacher, how close are you to the right answers? And without missing a beat, he looked at her and said, about two seats away. We all struggle at different times. If we get honest, we have them, they hit us, and those struggles can be different. Those struggles can look different, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, we, we look at life and we think, geez, I, 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 we got them. And, you know, we have these struggles. And what I did this week is I went online and I printed off this sheet that, that had 110 of the most common struggles that people face in their life. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go through basically what it was. You take the sheet and you hit check, check, check if, you, if you've struggled with this. And I thought, I'll go through this real quick, like, you know, and, and, and see which ones, you know, that will, probably won't be very many out of the 110 that I struggle with. So I took the sheet and I sat down and I started going, anger, check, anxiety, check, apathy, check, arrogance, yeah, not so much with this special person, you know. <laughs> Check. Boasting, control issues, complaining. You know, I mean, it just went on and on. You know, fantasy, fear, failure, fear, rejection, guilt, shame, gossip, lust, materialism, pride, self-righteousness, selfishness, resentment, self-worth, social anxiety, unforgiveness. Check, 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 all the way down. And the list goes on and on. 
And I think if I were to pass that out to you here this morning, you probably all would have been probably, if you're honest, checking off maybe just as many as I did. And I know when we talk about struggles, sometimes we look at it and there's these cute little things that we struggle with. But I think for most of us, struggles are very real. And I think it sometimes the struggles that we go through can feel like a 52 car pile upon our chest with the anxiety and the worry and the, the concern, you know, am I being the, uh, the mother? Am I being the father? A- am I being the Christian? Am I being, you know, uh, we've got the struggles of, uh, am I doing it right? You know, how's work going? Where's money? I mean, things are getting tough with money these days with, with, with the prices going up. How are we going to afford it? And you, you got this pressure, you got this stress and, and family, the family, the more I work with, it just seems to get more and more out of control with, with the kids. My marriage gets more and more out of control and we struggle. It just seems like we struggle more and more how to just navigate through life, how to navigate through life. So what I'd like to do as we start our time here with is just ask you to, in your mind, to kind of think about this, this question here, you know, what do we do with these struggles that we all have, that we all say, yes, we have these struggles. What do we do with these struggles? I mean, how, how do we get through them? Maybe uh, uh, more importantly, how do we find ourselves to be faithful in them? How do we find ourselves to be faithful in? Because here's what I know. I mean, here, here's a, a very familiar passage that I'm sure you've all maybe heard before, maybe heard taught on, you know, Romans 8, 28, and, you know, it says, and we know that in all things, the good things that happen to us are struggles. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So maybe a better question to ask ourselves as we start our time off here this morning, you know, thinking about it and hearing that scripture, is it possible that God who loves us, the pos- is it possible that the God that has, you know, these great plans, is it possible the God that has this wonderful purpose for us in our lives, is it possible that he also wants to meet us in our struggles and meet us in our struggles and it work out to be very, very good for us? And I ask that question because I think a lot of people today, Christians included, might say No. Might say no. And, and I added this part to this series that we're in, talking about rethinking the different things in our life. And today I want us to rethink about the struggles that we go through. And we're going to be doing that by taking a look at the life of Paul and everything of, of what's happening to his life and what's been happening in his life. And, and, and we're going to take a look in the book of Philippians as we're going through there and see where he's at. But, but I, I kind of want to bring you up to speed and help you understand what happened before uh, this letter here that is read, before the people in, in Philippi, before they're reading this. I want to kind of take you back and, and, and help you realize everything that's happened, okay? And you can read about this in, in Acts chapter 16. There's this, there's this vision of this man from Macedonia, you know, somebody in Europe that the saying, come over and help us. So Paul, you know, he recognized that it's time to take the gospel over to Europe. And, and so for the very first time, he does that. And he takes his friend Silas and, and they go in and they walk into this, this community. This community is Philippi. And they're walking around and, and they can't find anybody that's a believer. And it's like, well, let's see if we can find some Jewish, you know, brothers. And they can't even find any Jewish brothers. And so they go out and they go to this river and they run into this gal named Lydia. Lydia is there with some other ladies. And, and they start sharing the gospel with her. And immediately Lydia accepts the gospel and is so excited about that that she says, you got to come to my house and can you do this teaching? So Paul and Silas go to her house and they're teaching that. And, and, and people are coming and, and there's like this gospel explosion that's happening. And it's really cool. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's a powerful thing that's taking place. And then Paul and Silas start walking the streets trying to meet some new people. And in the middle of walking the streets, wherever they're at, downtown or whatever, they run into this slave girl. And this slave girl is able to tell the people's future. And Paul, you know, he understands and he's able to discern that she gets this gift of being able to tell the people's future because she's possessed. And so not only is she a slave physically, but she's a slave spiritually. And Paul decides to set her free and cast out the demons. Great for her, but for Paul and Silas, not so, because the people who she was a slave to, they lost that income and they were mad. And so Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. And, you know, they're in prison for a little while and they say, hey, let's start worshiping God. In spite of our circumstances that we find ourselves, let's start praising and worshiping God. And so they do. And if you remember the stories, they're praising and worshiping God. This earthquake comes and, you know, and it just shakes everything and all the prison doors come open. And, and you know, the, the prison guard, he comes in and he sees this and he's like, oh, my word, they've escaped. He thinks he's going to lose his life. And, and everybody stayed. And they're loving the worship. And everybody comes to Christ, the prison guard and all this. They come to Christ. And, and then Paul and Silas get out of prison. They go back to Lydia's house. And they're, they're, they're just being thankful and worshiping. And then they leave, okay? 
Now, I know I just threw a lot at you right there, but, but I wanted to, to give you that because I wanted you to understand, you know, before we dig into what we're going to dig, dig into, that the Philippian church, when they first met Paul, they had a wow type of experience and attitude towards Paul and to who he was in the ministry in his life. I mean, literally, lives are just instantly being transformed. I mean, you know, demons being cast out, being released from prison because of this earthquake. I mean, people believe in the people like, hey, just sign me up for this. It was this beautiful, powerful experience that they have with Paul. And then 10 years go by, a decade later, and they catch up with Paul. He's not blowing through towns, you know, spearheading some local revivals like he was. He's not facing down demons, uh, per se, with that. He's, he, you know, he's not watching his prison cells open up. He's in cells there, and, and, and he finds himself where he's at. He's in prison, yes, not just for a couple hours or a couple weeks, but for a long period of time that he's there. And I'm sure the people of Philippi, they can't imagine this. I mean, this is my thoughts with it, but you can't imagine. This is Paul, the Paul that we know, the Paul that we experienced, you know, and maybe it's even a little worse than that. They're hearing that from across the sea, that all these people that were doing the gospel with Paul, helping spread the good news of Jesus and these people coming to it, as soon as Paul gets locked up, there's these, these people that, that all of a sudden kind of have, I guess the best way to describe it is like this weird power grab, you know, this land grab, this, this gospel is about me kind of thinking, and his friends just totally leave him. And so when the people of the church of Philippi, they're opened this letter from their friend some 10 years later, I, I set it up this way because I'm sure they have some questions, maybe questions that we would still have today, like what kind of heart are we going to hear from this man? What, 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 what's he going to be writing about? I mean, this guy, Paul, literally is buried beneath the rubble of his circumstances. So what's he going to say to us? What's, what's the attitude going to be like? And I kind of have a feeling as soon as they open it up that maybe they were caught a little bit off guard because I think it can even catch us off guard when we understand and we start to hear. You know, they didn't find this guy that was, was, was down in the dumps. They found this guy with his heart that was full of joy. He's saying, hey, it's so good to hear about what's been happening and going on in your lives. Let me tell you what God has done. Let me speak into you some courage. And he just starts right out of the gate sharing that with him in... in, in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. It's like, you know, I, I probably know what you've been thinking. Like I said, we'd probably be thinking the same thing. You're thinking, man, Paul's down on his luck. His friends have left. I mean, he's going to be so sad to hear this. He's going to be bummed because of the circumstances that he's in, but they find Paul confident. They find Paul at peace, literally, you know, I mean, he's, he's in there in this situation. He's literally writing books like, uh, books like Colossians that we know to the church that he started there. For me, I think it's, it's one of the most articulate books on the supremacy of Christ talking about here's Paul sitting in these circumstances, talking about how amazing Jesus is. You know, he, he wrote like the book of Ephesus while he's there and he's writing that part of it. And again, another great book about, you know, what we've been given in Christ. So not only is he sitting in these circumstances that aren't pleasant and he's talking about how great Christ is, but all the blessings we have for following Christ. And then of course he writes to those in Philippians, which is, I think for me, one, one of the best perspective shifting books that we find within the New Testament. Because as, as he sits there and as they open the book, Paul's just, he's like, I need you to know man, I'm doing good. I need you to know. I'm not a product of my circumstances. There's something that God has been doing in me, and I want to share that with you. And that's what I want us to take a look into Paul's writing, because like I said at the beginning, so many of us struggle and will struggle and have struggled, but I'm telling you, I still believe in the midst of our struggle, you know, we ask that question, what can I find? I think it's important that. What can we find about God? What, what could we find out about us? that would help us navigate those, those places so that we can kind of have that same heart that, that Paul had, that we can walk out more, more strong, more confident, full of peace, maybe more focused. You see, I think there's some things that Paul would say to us, and, and you know, he'd say, listen, I know those of you that are going to struggle, which is all of us. I think he would say, understand, you're struggling, and your struggles are an opportunity your struggles are an opportunity for God to grow something powerful inside of you. 
I know it feels like a setback, you know. I, I know you feel like you're distancing maybe from, from maybe what God wants, but I believe, you know, as we look at that, he would say, I'm telling you that it, it might be the very opportunity that you need to grow that thing inside of you that you might be the most powerful, so you might be the most powerful thing about you in your life. And, and, you know, Paul, he has this heart. He has this beautiful heart. He has this, this outlook. He doesn't really explain to, to, in, in the book of Philippians why he has that, but we know why he has that because of what he shared with us in Romans when he was talking to the Romans. Romans 5, verse 3, he said this. He says, listen, we also glory in our sufferings because we know, we know we've been convinced because we know that suffering produces perseverance and pers- perseverance produces character and character produces hope. Paul's like, walking with Jesus, I've got a little bit of insight over the years, okay? And if you want to know how you can lean into God and see if God is doing and wanting to do something powerful in your life, he says, first and foremost, you have to understand it starts with suffering. It starts with suffering. And suffering there, when we take a look at it and and what it means, it simply means, you know, it means to push together, to press, extreme pressure, a lot of the times the way it was used is, is in, in their day, and, and still today, they collected the, you know, one of the most important, beautiful things that they had that they used was olive oil. And, you know, they would go out, and like I said, you can still go over there today, and you can still see them and the different olive trees, and they're collecting that and everything. But they would go out, and they would collect in these baskets all these different olives. And then, like you'll see in this picture here, they would stack those baskets on top of each other, and then they would take these, these rocks, that, that these stones that, you know, would heavy, heavy, heavy stones, put them on this like a cantilever, and and then they would begin to lower that weight and and on top of those olives, and that would press down and cause extreme pressure as it would crush the olives. And out of that situation, out of that extreme weight that's being pressed upon them would come this beautiful thing that they used and that they needed called olive oil. Does that make sense? You see, I, I think there's so many times that we don't understand when weight gets added to us that there can be a beautiful purpose behind this weight and this pressure and this suffering that's coming into our life. A lot of the times where we mess up is, 10 fingers pointed here, as I like to say, where I mess up is I think I can handle the weight on my own. I think I can, hey, you know, it doesn't matter. Give me more. You know, it's like when you go in and lift weights, yeah, put more on, <laughs> you know, and all this other kind of stuff. I don't need a spotter. I can handle this. And you're sitting there thinking, I got it. I got it. And then all of a sudden you realize halfway up, I don't got it. You know, I don't have it and, uh, and stuff. And, and, and I think as we go through this, you know, when it comes to that, you know, in our mind, you know, Paul is saying, look, at, you have to understand how important these situations and these opportunities are to know that, yeah, this is coming on you and you don't have it and you can't control it, but there's someone that you can. And there's something that God can take this. And when we turn to him, when we surrender him, as you heard Lauren talking about uh, as he was out here, when we turn and surrender him, he can do things and make something beautiful come out of this situation, more beautiful than we can ever imagine. And he says, when we take those sufferings and we realize that and we turn it to God and surrender to God, out of what can start to be developed, one of the things is perseverance. And again, perseverance in our English language, I think, is kind of falls short of what is being used here and what's being said. Most likely, or not most likely, but the way we look at perseverance is we kind of define it as like, I'm just going to stand here and kind of brace myself for whatever's coming my way. And when it hits me, I hope I'm still standing. That's kind of how we look at perseverance or define perseverance. But back then, it, it was used mean to, 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 to go under and to stand. It was actually one of the most manliest terms you could use back then. They used it to refer to a guy, a Greek god, maybe heard of him, called Atlas. Ever hear Atlas? You know, the guy that, you know, went under and lifted and had held the world on his shoulders that was there. And Paul's saying, the funny thing is this. When you start allowing this weight in your life, when you surrender, when you're going through the struggles and you turn to God, and and that weight, God will allow to push something out that's so beautiful and so valuable in you that's there. And, and when we realize that we need God, that we need his wisdom, that we need his word, that we need his family, and we turn to that, all of a sudden, this beautiful stuff that he starts having, this perseverance starts coming out of us, and we start having these muscles, these spiritual muscles, these faith muscles, I've heard them called, these Holy Spirit muscles. And all of a sudden, it starts producing in you, if, not, not the ability just to kind of stand there and take it, you know, but the strength. The kind of strength that actually the strength that we've always longed for, to be that person that we want to be to, to, to our family, to be that person that we want to be uh, to wherever we find ourselves. 
And God says, when you allow this to happen, when I allow this to happen to me, then I begin to become strong. I become strong and, and I start standing under the weight, under the weight that, that, that I can't carry on my own. And he says, when that happens, then that leads to something called character in your life, this perseverance. And basically, simply, that just means that you are inwardly what you claim to be externally. You know, he simply says that when the weight that's been pushing on you pushes out something valuable and you begin to stand it, you start to become the kind of person that can handle that weight, then you start to recognize, I'm finally inwardly what I claim to be externally. And he says that leads to hope. And hope is just that strong and confident expectation that God is who God says that he is and that he's really changing you the way that you always dreamed that he would. You know, there's this process. We have the struggles, struggles you don't want. Maybe it feels too heavy, but if you surrender it to him, you know, you're going to end up having this confidence, this strength you never dreamed of. And your struggle is an opportunity for God to grow something powerful inside of you and use you in ways you could never dream. But then he also says, Paul says, your struggle is an opportunity for others to see God clearly, to see him clearly. In verse 13, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And, and to me, I like it because what, what it, it seems like Paul's saying, you know what seems kind of strange is, you would think that me being in prison, me being captured, me being put in prison, me being sitting in chains would actually be confusing to all these people, right? I mean, how is God using that? How is that God working? It would be confusing and everything because... You know, and, and it does get confusing today when we read through this in here because look at the kind of gospel, sadly, sometimes that's preached, that's out there and it's taught today and, and, and stuff about, you know, turning to God and everything being hunky-dory and okay and, 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 and stuff in our life, you know, and, and, uh, um, and you know, I, I don't throw a whole lot of Greek words out there, but, you know, when, when, if there's somebody telling you that when you give your life to Christ, everything's going to be 100% okay and your life's going to be good from that, you can use this Greek work at them every single time. It's called baloney, Okay. <laughs> You've heard me say that before, but, but that's true because it's not. That's not, that, not I, I'm not saying good things won't happen to you, and I'm not saying that God won't bless you in different ways in different times, but, you know, it's not what we experience, and, and you have God, and, and, and he says, you know, and again, in the midst, it's the weirdest thing because all these guards and, and, and everything that are coming to see me are kind of starting to finally understand about the gospel, that the gospel is when the Spirit of Christ moves in the midst of his people. And things get real, and things get gritty, and his presence just shows up in these beautiful, powerful ways. Like the gospel is what happens when your circumstances aren't perfect. And it's just not perfect people. It's like real people with real struggles and real life. And God somehow, even when the circumstances aren't what you would choose for your life and want to be in, there's this radiance inside of you, this brilliance that comes because we're a child of the king. Or a child of the king. And, and Paul, he's waiting to go to trial for, before Caesar here. And, and the thing is, you know, he, he's assigned these guards. These, these are the guards, the body, personal body guards of Caesar. So it's not just anybody that's there. Paul is chained and surrounded by some of the best bodyguards on the planet at that time. So you have the Philippians that have experienced this kind of Paul. And 10 years later, now for the last 10 years, Paul, he's been pushed off cliffs. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. I mean, everything you can imagine, been bitten by snakes has happened, Okay. And most of the people, they see his imprisonment and they think, man, I can't believe that. I mean, think about that. Why would God stop that? Why would God stop a man so, so powerful like Paul, who's been going up and down the Mediterranean and planting these little ecclesias, these little gatherings, these little churches? Why would he stop that? And Paul's looking at it like, hey, I'm having conversations. There's people coming to me that I never knew would come to me. I'm having conversations with some people that would like to push me off the cliff, but they can't. I've got bodyguards, <laughs> you know? And, and, and he's on a spot where he's writing and, and, and spending time. And all of a sudden, I think it becomes clear to a whole bunch of people that maybe God is not asleep behind the wheel. That maybe God actually knows what he's doing. Because in the midst of our struggles, when we turn to God and allow God to work through us, it's an opportunity for others to see God clearly. To see God clearly, which leads me to the third thing is, our struggle is an opportunity to fuel others' faith. To fuel others' faith, you know, and I believe this. Verse, verse 14, Paul says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. 
few things in life that fuel my faith uh, more than anything else is when I see a brother or sister in Christ that are going through struggles, that are being challenged, and whatever those may be, but yet I still see them passionate for Christ, their eyes turned to Christ, their love for Christ being there. Because I really believe that people have an ear for you in the middle of your struggle a lot of the times, unlike any other season of your life. And, and, and people look in and they, they, they start seeing in the midst of your struggle that, you know what? Faith is bigger than circumstances. Faith is bigger than circumstances. And they look into that struggle and they say, hey, listen, I don't know how that guy, I don't know how that gal with everything that's on them, that's pressing in on them and everything, I don't know how they're still finding that time to be so excited about God, you know, to have this intimacy with God, but yet I see it in them. I don't see how in the midst of that, you know, they don't have all the answers. They don't know why it's happened to them, but in their circumstances, you know, aren't what they would like, but I just see them continue to turn to God and I watch God show up in their life. I keep watching his hand on them, you know, even in the midst of all that. And family, when people see that, not only does when we turn to God in that situation, can it help change us, but it helps changes others. You know, when I was going through this, I had this question I kept asking myself over and over, and it's a question I'm going to challenge you here to maybe think about and ask yourself as we get ready to come and, and partake in communion here in just a few moments. But I kept asking myself as I was preparing this and I was thinking about these struggles and how God can use them when I go through and these points that I just shared here. And I kept asking myself, David, what do people see when I go through my struggles? You know, when I'm struggling in a situation, whatever it is, and I'm before the people, what, what, what do they see, you know? And I would ask you to maybe just kind of think of that yourself here this morning, those that call yourself followers of Christ. When you go through a struggle, you maybe stop and think, well, what is it people are seeing? What are they seeing me? Are they seeing something so radiant, so pure, and so dependent on the Father that it will literally impact them in ways that will transcend what I could ever speak to them at any other time? I mean, I think about that with my friendships. I think about that, you know, with the church. I think about that. Those that are closest watching my struggle, what are they seeing? Because I believe God used Paul's chains so that he could experience the kind of growth deep down that he longed for. I, I think that's true. And I think that, that he does that also to help others, people see the gospel more clearly. And, and I think he used Paul's change to help others be more confident. That's what Paul was saying in that scripture, to be more confident, to be more courageous but I also think he still wants to do the same thing for his church today to work and to move in this. And I realize, I think there might be some people, you know, watching today, maybe even sitting in this room today that would say, well, I hear you, Dave. And, and, and I am struggling right now. I do feel like I, maybe not a 52 car pile up, but you know, I do feel like I have this pressure and it doesn't feel like God's growing anything in me. <laughs> And it doesn't feel like people are seeing God more clearly because of me. And it doesn't feel like I'm encouraging them. It actually feels like they're probably picking up on my negativity more than they are anything positive in my faith. And I completely understand that, you know. I completely understand when we're going through the struggle that's there. But it, we, we go through that because of what we've learned before. And it, it's because of this worry that we have. It, it's, you know, we, we get thinking, we get worried, well, how come that person's going through it and I, and they're doing it great and I'm, maybe I'm not as this Christian, maybe I'm not all I could be that God wants me to be. They've got it figured out, these super people, but I worry all the time. I mean, I stress about stuff. I'm stressed about when you're going to finish your sermon. I get worried about everything that's going on and that I just can't handle it. I have all this stuff that's going on. I get overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. And when I was in Bible college, <clears throat> the president at that time was Dr. Nofel Staten. And I had a class with him. And Dr. Staten said, you know, something just to be thinking about, because as a pastor, as a Christian, as someone who follows Jesus, you're going to have struggles. And when you go through the struggle, he says, I want to remind you of something And that. Remember the name that God gave his people in the Old Testament. Remember he had his chosen people. And what name did he give them when you think about that? I mean, you know, Abraham's the father of the chosen people. Did he call them Abrahamites? You know, No. I mean, even though that might sound a little cool. I mean, Moses was a great leader of the people in the Old Testament. They call them Mosites, Mosesites, something along those lines. English people, you can help me out a little bit later with that. You know, did, what did he call them? What did he name them? Israelites. And what does Israel simply mean? One who struggles with. Now, why this God who creates everything we know, picks these chosen people, why would he give his people that name? Yeah, I can't read the mind of God, but I would like to think, you know, 
that it would be because he wanted his people to know that he is a God that meets them and still today meets us in the midst of our struggle. He is the one that shows up, you know, even when there's weight. He's always willing when we surrender to him to make something beautiful come out that'll help us stand up and be stronger than we ever dreamed of so that we can actually internally be what we long to be externally and so that your eyes can be set on something strong and something confident. And again, I know some of you in this room might be saying, man, I I love all that, Dave, but I don't think you understand the weight that I'm under right now. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, but I know one who does. And I just want to say to you, we're in just a moment here, we're going to get ready. There's two tables on the side, two tables in the back that you can go back and, and there's two cups together. If you take those cups and just come back to your seat and take some time and just think and remember the sacrifice and celebrate and give thanks for the sacrifice of God's son and his love. But, but I, I, I want you to, you know, just ask yourself this, how's doing it on your own working for you? I mean, if I can get that, ask that person of a question. Because like I said earlier, 10 fingers pointed here, there are many, many times I think I can handle it on my own. I could do it my way. This struggle, this suffering, whatever it is, I think I can take care of it. And I don't think I need God. I don't think I need to turn to the family of God. I don't think I need to pick up the phone and call any of you because, you know, I can take it. I've got it. And it's a humbling thing when you realize you need people in your life. You know, you want to be there. Because doing it on your own, you can't. You know, again, I was, I was humbled this past week. Those of you uh, in, that uh, might not know or are aware, about a couple months ago, I had this little thing on the back of my neck kind of show up, and it decided to balloon into this great big humongous thing where Friday I had a surgery on it. But here's the thing with it. That time, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know if it was an abscess. They went from calling it abscess. They went from calling it that to a, uh, a cyst, you know, because the crazy thing, I had to put a bandage on it. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't see the back of my neck. And I tried to contort in many different positions to do this on my own, trust me, okay, because it was gross, all right? I'm going to gross you out before lunch, so this may be help you, you know, those on diet. I mean, the thing would pop, and there'd be put and ooze. It would not look good. It would not feel good. I couldn't clean myself. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get the Band-Aids. I still can't after the surgery. Actually, this one's falling off right now. But anyhow, you know, I, I couldn't do that on my own, and I had to ask for help. I had to ask people to help me, you know, hey, look at this gross thing on the back of my neck, would you? It's got ooze and pus coming out and slap a Band-Aid on it with me. I mean, I'm sorry. You don't like to do that, you know, but I needed help just in that situation. We need each other, you know, and, and, and so I want to say, how is what you're doing with any struggles that maybe you're in, how's it doing trying to do it on your own? Because no, I may or I may not know the struggles that you're going through, but I know one that can carry that. We look to so many different things in this world. So many different things that we think will help us out, whatever it is, our popularity, our, our, our finances, you know, our 401k, we rely on all these different things. And when the weight really hits, when the pressure really hits, we find out that those cannot withstand that within our life. They're not going to bring usually anything good out of that. There's only one who can, and his name is Jesus, and he loves you. And so as you take these emblems here, and as the worship team continues to lead us in song, I, I just want you to realize he is willing to meet you in the midst of when you struggle, or maybe if you're struggling today, he is willing to meet you in the midst of that struggle. And so if you've got a struggle today that you want to pull alongside with someone, don't leave here today. The leadership will be here. Come and talk with us, and we'd love to talk with you as we talk about doing life together and be there to see how we can help. If you're watching online and you've got some struggles that you're going through and, and, and it's frustrating, you don't know what to do, give us a call. We're here. We want to be here. But let's just go before him right now during this time and give thanks and praise. Father, I do thank you so much. I thank you for just this opportunity to gather as we've been able to gather here today and and, and to worship you in song, Father God, to hear your word, to be reminded how active and how passionately you want to be a part of our lives each and every day. And I praise you for being that kind of God, that kind of Lord, uh, Father. And I pray as we come and we take these emblems and we partake of them, Father God, and we're reminded of the love that was there because of the sacrifice of your son that was given for us. I I, I pray that we can also be reminded, Heavenly Father, of how you are still willing to be with us today. You still have that same amount of love for us today. And may your spirit speak to us and help us to understand, Lord. Help us to understand, Father God, have we called out to you 
during these struggles? Do we understand that maybe in the midst of everything that we're going through, you can really use it to grow us in a way we can never imagine, to teach others and help others see you in ways that, you know, we could talk to them all day, but our actions, because we turn to you, can help them understand how wonderful you are. Father, whatever that is, may your spirit speak to us. May we hear it, receive it, and act upon it today. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness. You are so faithful to us. Morning by morning, new mercies every day. Father, we need you. When we struggle, we need to realize that we can count on you. And Father, if someone says to me, ah, your God's a crutch, I'll take two. 
is, Father, I need you to help me. And you are faithful and just. Thank you for all that you do for us as we go our way this morning. Let us carry the word and our worship with us everywhere we go. And let you be what they see when they look at us. In your name.